Welcome to the Good Life Pledge table. Um, it's really, really excited to be with you all. Um, my name is Taj James. I'm the uh, one of the co-founders of um, of uh, Full Spectrum Capital Partners, and along with Kat Taylor, uh, co-founder of uh, co-creator of um, Good Life Pledge, and um, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna tell you a little bit about the journey that we've been on with uh, a powerful group of seven communities that we're connected to who are helping to bring this to life. And um, you know, I want to want to invite you, Kat, to offer any words of welcome before we jump into this. Just really eager to share the learning journey and um, you know where we are at this point. Thanks. All right. So, um, so, so, so today is a little bit of a celebration. It's, it's been a year since uh, COCAP 2021 when um, uh, Regan Pritzker, Kat, and I got together and, and uh, officially launched the Good Life Pledge. But we want to take, we want to take you on a little bit of the journey for, for how we got here. And, you know, it's been a, a, a real honor to, to work with you, Kat, over the years and understand how your commitment and passion for justice began at a very young age and, and, and how, how this journey is sort of connected to that. But um, the, the story kind of has a few chapters and we like to say Spartanburg was the spark, you know, the Equitable Development Working Group was the lab, the village was the catalyst and SOCAP 21 was the launch. So this, this story has got a few a few dimensions to it. And it begins in Spartanburg. And, and Kat, I wanted to see if you wanted to share a little bit about um, meeting uh, former state Senator Harold Mitchell and, and what that did for your sense of the possible. Sure. Um, and I don't know, Taj, if this is where we're going to talk about what we've learned in the last year. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because I'm, um, not to go off script, but I think I need to um, reflect on what I've learned uh, throughout the journey. Um, so, um, I guess beginning with philanthropy, philanthropy is very important because it attends to immediate needs and, and, uh, preventing suffering as much as it can, but it has inherent limitations. It actually takes money to make money and wealth has been stripped from frontline black and Brown communities. Um, uh, whereas if there were assets in those communities, they could generate the income that could even replace philanthropy. And uh, in a sense, philanthropy to me is an admission of failure, because if we were running society right in the first place, we wouldn't need so much charity to sort of, you know, staunch the wounds. Um, social enterprise, which we have practiced a lot, uh, creating beneficial state bank and two venture funds is an essential ingredient of an economy that uh, can be based on sacred values, reciprocity and mutualism, um, but it has limitations as well. And just for one example, when the bank seeks to lend into frontline communities that lack an equity or net worth, uh, it's very difficult. The debt doesn't sit on top of, of uh, a lack of equity comfortably. So we have to recognize that that's um, a necessary condition to solve. Um, another example uh, is that we started Tomcat Ranch to uh, gain the insights of an actor in the ag system, and we know we need to move to regenerative uh, practice and restore agricultural opportunities for traditional indigenous black people of color communities, but they lack land access because land was stolen, and that's another asset that needs to be shifted back. Um, we can engage in policy and legislative work to get the rules right but you need capital to be on the game board at all to um, for those rules to have any relevance. Um, we certainly need to uh, be in cultural strategies and narrative shift because we're trying to win hearts and minds, um, not just um, uh, kind of uh, suggest prescriptive moves without inspiration. Um, so all of this uh, recognition of uh, that these are uh, necessary strategies, but they're not sufficient. They're not going to get us over 
uh, into the beloved community in which we all seek to live. So that's when uh, we considered the necessity of asset transfer, wealth transfer, um, rest restoration of self-determination based on uh, wealth, community and individual wealth. Um, so it, just to note some of the lessons of the last year, um, and we did a Spartanburg um, is one of our mentor communities. I met Harold Mitchell on the presidential campaign. Uh, as you know, he and his community with a community engagement process and community led vision and plan parlayed a $20,000 EPA grant into $300 million of capital investment, which is necessary for that self-determination and shifting of power. Um, and it is those place-based community led development strategies that actually yield the most informed and likely to succeed solution stack. Um, and his is an incredible, uh, that community solution stack is an incredible. I'm uncovering federally qualified health clinics, affordable housing, lease to own housing, um, industry, new industry in the renewables in terms of energy and other things. Um, and it goes on and uh, they continue to develop solutions for their community. Um, uh, another lesson of the last uh, year has been that when the mentor communities and cohort communities get together in community, in circle, they have uh, enormous insights to offer one another and support that's really essential. Um, and I'm going to just um, leave us all with the possibility that uh, a complement to place-based uh, community, equitable community economic development and shifting assets to those communities is creating assets for everybody. If we think about organizing um, businesses that constitute network effects, monopolies like Netflix, YouTube, Facebook, everything as platform cooperatives and think about strategies to give micro shares of equity in these big commerce platforms to the users as another way to build wealth, um, democratize the ownership of these big monopolies um, and ensure that community values are adhered to on those platforms, not profit maximization. Whew. Beautiful. Thank you, Kat. Um, and so if you're, if you're listening in, you basically just heard the last chapter of the story, Kat, Kat reflecting on the big lessons of the journey over the last year. And, and so now we're going to go back to the beginning. And I'm going to give you a little, little preview of kind of how we got here. And as, as Kat said, um, the connection with, with uh, Harold and, and, and Regenesis was the, the spark in terms of imagining what was possible. Um, Kat has been in deep relationship with uh, our brother, Peter Bratt, the filmmaker, who's also a leader in Friendship House. And um, Kat decided to make a commitment to the village uh, to support the work there. And the commitment that she made to the village um, became a commitment that has been made to now um, the village and four other communities to, to bring significant assets to the work that they're doing. So, so the, the connection and relationship with the village sort of expanded into five communities. And these five communities, which, which, um, yeah, and then we got together and, and launched it, uh, launched it last year. So, and since then, we've had the village uh, share their work with uh, with the broader SoCap community at Spectrum. Um, and uh, you're going to hear more from Brother Elder later, who uh, who had some deep conversation with Kat recently on Elder's podcast. So you're going to get a deep dive into that if you want. So we've. We've done a lot in the last year, and we're gonna we're gonna dig into more of where the community's at, uh, and and some of what they're what they're learning. But but um, before we get into that, I wanted to see Kat if you can just share a little bit about well what you know, what is the Good Life Club? We've been talking about it, but but what in the heck what in the heck is it exactly? So a little akin to the Giving Pledge, which was a commitment by high net worth individuals to give half of their wealth away during their lifetime, and. Uh, reiterating that that's necessary but insufficient, we created, co-created a pledge. It's a work in progress. Um, it's a, a pledge to give one third of our assets away, um, shifting them to community control, ownership, um, and ownership uh, during our lifetime in order to attend to that lack of wealth in community. Um, and uh, uh, therefore create more possibilities of innovation um, and self-determination self for those communities. We began the pledge um, by working in concert with five cohort communities 
um, the village being uh, one of them, but also uh, Urban Till Cooperation Richmond, uh, the Big Wee Foundation in Memphis, Allensworth, the first um, community financed and founded by Black Californians, and um, uh, Eldra's uh, group Inside Circle and the Aspire Housing um, Vision. So uh, we chose those five cohort communities. Um, we work uh, also in concert with mentor communities, Spartanburg, South Carolina, the Regenesis Institute, Harold Mitchell's organization, and Push Buffalo with Rawa, in, um, also as communities that are out in front on community-led development and from which we can learn much. Um, we invite others into the pledge, either by joining and making a commitment of assets to those five cohort communities or bringing their own communities into the circle um, and making a commitment of current grant funding to uh, support capacity building and for capital absorption needs, but also the shifting of assets of some sort into those communities. So that's it. And I think the thing I'll um, thing I'll just add to you is, you know, the, what what um, really characterizes the the asset holders, philanthropists, investors um, who, who really are helping to build and grow out this this um, this good life pledge community is, you know, you are you are all folks who um, who really trust community, who really uh, understand that that's where the solutions are and are, are all good listeners and are, and are willing to partner with communities well to, to, to do what's needed and, and, and um, deliver what's, per, you know, deliver what, 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 what the communities most need to move forward their solutions. So um, it, it's, it's been a real pleasure to kind of grow and help to weave this community over the last few years. So what we're going to do today is we're going to give you a few updates from some of the communities who, who aren't here with us, and then we're going to get a deep dive into the work of Inside Circle, um, Aspire, and, and Justice Capital. So um, just just a few things I want to celebrate. Um, any of you who, who are aware of the amazing work of Push Buffalo, and Laura will probably drop some links in the chat to some of the groups so you can find out more about what they're doing. Um, they, they're about to get a new mayor, it looks like, and uh, it's a real power and, and testament to, to the grassroots economic power building work that's been done there. The community there started just with a few blocks, and now they've they've done economic development in a in a fifty block radius, and really just demonstrated what what happens when communities get access to the right some kind of capital and support. And they're just finished a big, big giant sort of housing project that no one thought they could do, and, and got done. And they're about to take on a, a giant um, 1.5 megawatt uh, community solar initiative there. So big things happening, big, big things happening in, in both um, uh, in both uh, Buffalo and in Spartanburg. Spartanburg is also getting ready for some big energy projects to build on the community uh, economic development that they've done there recently. And have got, got some other big plans in the works. So, so the sort of the, 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 the mentor communities that we work with continue to kind of raise the bar and take it to the next level in, in partnership with the other communities. Um, uh, the other community I want to mention is, is Memphis and, and that's the, the, the site of historic Claiborne temple where the sanitation workers were, were doing their historic strike when, when Martin Luther King was assassinated there. And uh, at Claiborne Temple, uh, the Nasa Troutman and the Big Wee Foundation are moving forward that that bold vision that that King was organizing for there of, of what it looks like when we when we address uh, racial and gender injustice and, and economic injustice uh, all all at once. And and they're and they're doing some new land acquisitions in Memphis and um, working with the land bank there to kind of expand some of their their economic development um, prospects beyond some of the neighborhoods they've been working in. So, so big, big things happening in Memphis. Um, Want to pass to Chad to see if you can give, give any updates with uh, what's happening with the village. We know he's, you and Laura spent some time with them this week. And uh, maybe you want to talk a little bit about what's what's going on there. Sure, yeah. Uh, so for those who don't know, the village is, um, well, they say a 21st century solution to a 21st century reality, which is the, you know, the, the profile of urban Indians um, is intertribal without, you know, physical or cultural home, really. And 
there's 720,000 American Indians in Alaska natives in California and 90% of them live in cities. That was, that was an, that was an eye opener for me. Um, so this is going to be uh, at home, a center, uh, both of healing um, and services, but also of opportunity and, and wealth, community wealth building for the American Indian community in San Francisco and the American Indian cultural district. So that's what it is. Um, what's new is uh, everybody's probably heard about the justice 40 initiative from the Biden administration, which is great. Um, the, Village was lucky to be included in the Justice 40 Accelerator, which basically is preparing communities and organizations to receive those funds when they win. I'm saying when optimistically those start flowing. Um, so Justice 40 um, was, a, was a great achievement for them, the Accelerator. And then the other exciting part is for me to think about, yes, there's harm that we need to repair and there's reparations to do, but there's really if you take a reciprocity mindset, um, there's really value and and wisdom and healing that can come from these communities as well. And the exciting one that Laura and I heard about the other day, uh, we have a what I think of as a community wealth working group at the village. And one of the key principles is the idea of food as medicine. So uh, in partnership with a, with a group called Deep Medicine Circle, um, and their um, Rupa, Rupa Maria is a doctor that has uh, started that organization. Um, is thinking about how can we use the idea of food as medicine to both like heal this community, but also heal all, you know, everybody. Um, and in doing so create sort of an economic and, and a value generation engine around the village. Like can you imagine if doctors could prescribe like a good healthy diet <laughs> as a prescription, that's sort of one mental model I have for like how this community can help us, um, you know, heal, um, uh, more broadly, um, and just as a you know, as an example, the, the Rupa highlighted the stat that apparently sixty percent of the ER visits for COVID at her hospital were people that were also malnourished, and it were over eighty percent of people in the ICU were also malnourished. So I think food as medicine and culture as medicine uh, from this community is a really exciting development that um, you know I'm excited to to be a part of. Um, and I think just more broadly, we're trying to figure out how to create a model for urban Indian liberation and using this as a template. Like this doesn't exist, apparently doesn't really exist as a thing, um, as, a, as a type of entity in other cities. And so how can we create this in San Francisco and then build it out, expand it and sort of spread it to have you know, even more scaled impact uh, and healing throughout the country and the world. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's the village. Great, thanks Chad. Um, so the two other communities we wanna give, give some brief updates on are, um, Richmond and the reinvest in our power and urban health folks there and and the Allensworth community and and um, Kat's had some time to spend with with both of those communities recently a bunch of us were up in Allensworth for the annual celebration of of uh, that community and Colonel Allensworth at the state park there and meeting with community leaders and Kat wanted to see if if you could share some of the exciting updates of how Allensworth is collaborating with the State Parks Department to to help support the community-led development work there. Great. Thank you. Yeah, so <clears throat> Allensworth does host the State Historic Park. Um, so uh, another update that is in partnership with the parks, um, and there will be uh, several conversations going forward, is to really uh, optimize what that park represents, to tell the history accurately of the first black financed and funded town in California, of its power, of its prosperity, of its trajectory towards being a thriving beloved community, um, of the history of societal assault, removing the railroad spur, the source of water, the Tulare Lake, as trying to um, assassinating Colonel Allensworth, um, in the modern era, trying to locate vastly polluting industries on the edge, like confined animal, animal factory operations. Um, so uh, get, telling the history accurately is important. And then to contextualize that in the park offering with the modern struggle against disinvestment, displacement, and gentrification. Um, the very authentic leadership of Alan's Worth, which has been at this work for almost five decades, um, is in a co conversation with the Park Service to get that part right, but has also engaged um, the community to develop their own solution stack for reviving, uh, revitalizing the modern community of Allensworth. And some of those solutions, and I won't do justice to the full panoply of them, but they have a 60 acre tack farm, which is um, 
uh, based on regenerative ag practice um, to achieve food security and food sovereignty in their community, as well as commerce. Um, they also have a strategy to work with the local ecological organizations because they're in a very important ecosystem for ecotourism, uh, for youth development. They are, have plans to develop commerce again in Allensworth for self-sufficiency of the community. And they are on the corridor of the high-speed rail that's in development now. So working to make sure that that um, doesn't produce any harms for the community and actually um, facilitate some of the uh, planning and development that they want to do. And again, it's really important that that's a community-led process and we're um, it's, um, actually in a position to help Park Service achieve some of their goals of diversity and racial equity as we work together. Um, then um, the uh, community of Richmond has been um, at work for a long time in organizing uh, through Cooperation Richmond, Our Power, um, and the, their local farm, Urban Health. The, they are uh, in the shadow of the Chevron oil refinery. They have had to fight the harm that that industry and that player inflicts on communities, especially adjacent ones. And they're currently uh, helping to resist Chevron creating a 2.0 version in another non-renewable energy production that could potentially harm the community. Um, that's the sort of defensive work, but they've had some incredible wins on uh, the community planning and vision. Most notably, they have been able to um, acquire the acreage that constitutes the Urban Till Farm. Um, and that farm has been really busy during COVID. We actually partnered with them through Growing the Table to give more families access to fresh organic produce during the crisis, but also to support the farms that produce that organic produce in addition to Urban Till's own farm to make sure that we bridge BIPOC, LGBTQ+, Regen, organic farmers into the post-COVID food economy. Um, so the... Uh, it's just been a great time uh, for both of those communities. Um, and it, they have a lot of forward momentum and they are learning together with the other cohort and mentor communities. Thanks so much, Kat. Um, so we are, um, you're, you are all, you are all in for a really um, exciting treat. Um, if you think back to not last summer, but this the, the summer before that, um, we we were a part of many of us were a part of what um, most historians think to be the largest global mobilization in human history. And I think before that, it might have been the Women's March globally, and it was the it was the global uprising in, in, in defense of Black life uh, after the the heartbreaking murders of of Mr. Floyd and Ms. Taylor and too many others that, that uh, whose names we we must never forget. And in that moment, there was a recognition that um, that we need to reckon not just with our history and the truth of our history, but with the current reality of of the the violence that that is occurring in our communities uh, at the hands of the the, the institutions that. Um, that that many believe are there to, to 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 serve and support us, and so you know in the in the aftermath of that, um, there were about twelve billion dollars of financial commitments that were made to try to um, address that injustice. Uh, unfortunately, there was a recent report that came out that said only about a third of those financial commitments have been upheld. So as we invite. Um, you all to join us in this Good Life Pledge commitment. Um, the only thing more important than making a bold commitment is is keeping our commitments. So, so we're reminded that um, you know the commitment's only the beginning of the journey, and in partnership we can find our way forward. But, but one of the things that people don't don't understand very much about is that when folks are talking about you know supporting communities alternatives and, and, and resourcing community safety solutions and um, shifting resources out of police departments and, and prisons and jails and institutions that don't 
don't bring healing to our community, there hasn't been a lot of understanding of, of, of who are the people working in the communities who, who do the work of keeping communities safe. And what does it take to support those folks to, to absorb those resources at scale so that as the institutions that, that, that don't serve our community get divested of resources, that those resources actually go into the, the, the communities that have been harmed and they go into the hands of the people who, who know how to help us, know how to help us all to heal from what, um, what we've experienced. And so um, we're, you're, you're, you're in for a treat because we are going, to, um, we are going to, to reflect on this question. So Sister Nasa, who again is leader of uh, Big We Foundation and the work in, in, in Memphis has this notion that um, part of the reason why we're sick as a society is because the culture is sick. And that if we want to become well, we need a well culture. And that means, you know, telling the truth about who we are. Um, and that means telling stories that, that bring out the best of who we are uh, as, as uh, stewards in the web of life. Um, and so um, the other thing you're going to learn about, and this is true in Spartanburg, and this is true in Richmond, and this is true in all of the communities that we work in. And they all have communities to, to t- stories to tell about this, which is that when you're trying to do economic development, if people aren't safe, if people aren't well, you can't do anything. That, 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 that safety and, and health and wellness is the foundation for all the other goals we have in our community. And it's the foundation for shared economic prosperity and thriving. So, so this is um, uh, Sister Christina and Brother Eldra are going are gonna to take you deep into what is really required in that healing, what it really necessitates and, and, and calls on all of us to bring forward. And, uh, and we will all be transformed in this. In this. So um, I'm gonna pass it over to Eldra and Christina, and then you're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna go in, we're going in. Thanks, Tosh. Do we have the ability to show the video? Yes, I will, I will switch over to that now. And um, let me see here. Stop a share and start a share. I'm going to stop and I'm going to start. And then uh, I'm going to get this thing going here. So, one moment, please. Share. All right. Here we go. Let me, let me. Fix this. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. There we go. I served 24 years of a life sentence in the California prison system. I was somebody who was a career criminal. Prison is one of the most segregated places on the face of the planet. And, and uh, uh, inside, inside circle, circle was born, born out, of out of a huge, huge racial, racial riot, riot in 1996 on facility. Inside, inside circle, circle adopted me while I was serving that life sentence. And, and uh, uh, I was somebody, I was somebody who thought, I, who had thought I had it all figured out. And when I went inside, what I found was pain. I found trauma. I found a grown man who was hiding a little boy who had been hurt and didn't know how to deal with that. The system is failing us. What was found, what was discovered in those spaces, what was discovered in those healing circles was empathy. Humanity. Give the people the space to heal. So the way to treat the community and be effective is to treat the community as a whole. The way to get there is to treat the individual, every individual as a whole. Don't go for treatment categories, statistical outcomes. Approach everyone as an individual and meet their individual need. Um, In New Jersey right now, we're in six juvenile prisons within JJC, uh, and we work with, a, with cohorts of young men. We even build a youth back to the community model through the bridging program. We call it Young Adult Empowerment, where they attend weekly financial readiness, um, job readiness workshops, and also the healing circle component of dealing with the emotional turmoil of reeling in society. The more we do towards bettering ourselves, the more we can help someone else in that supportive process for them. We provide people the place and the space 
to figure out the things about themselves that they don't know what Inside Circle is looking to do is to create the spaces where individuals can deal with trauma. And that's why we're partnering with local community-based public health and safety programs, workforce and ownership training models, and justice capital to create that space within their own neighborhoods. Together, we will offer a first of its kind national network of next gen transformational housing and community centers with our services designed to be a cornerstone for both community healing as well as economic prosperity. This is something that we will be bringing across the nation. This is something that was born in a prison chapel in Folsom, California. And it, it, this is something that will spread from South Carolina to New Jersey and a city near you. So uh, thank you, Taj. And uh, it's always a pleasure to sit with you, Christina. When, when, when I think about the big vision of, of what it is that we're looking to do or, or uh, be a part of this uh, giving pledge is, is just what you just saw in that video is uh, creating spaces where, where people can heal, where communities can heal because where, you know, you hear a lot of talk about transferring wealth and transferring assets, which is, you know, definitely a, a big part of the uh, solution. And there is a need for healing. We're talking about addressing generational trauma. We're talking about empowering people to deal with and be in a different relationship around money, around community and around healing. And if I don't know how to be in relationship like that, if I don't know how to be healthy like that, you could give me all of the billions in the world. And what you're gonna have is an unhealthy community. We know what that looks like. What we're looking to build and support is healthy communities. What we're looking to do is not just infuse capital, into these communities, but infuse health into individuals and support individuals into empowering themselves and empowering their communities to grow into whole, healthy, and thriving institutions. That is the big vision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, if we look around us, Eldra, right? we see the existing models, literally the buildings of harm all around us. You know, you go to any downtown city anywhere, you see a 12 story prison, but you don't see the 12 story healing center, okay. right? We don't have those institutions um, of care. And yet the community has the solutions. We've all survived this long. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're still here, and we're going, to, and we're going to stay here, and we're going to win because this is all inevitable, right? Um, when services are not, when systems are not serving communities, new services and systems must be built. And so, you know, I think that um, knowing that the community already has the solutions, um, the unique approach that you know that we're bringing into this conversation, and that we've partnered with. Um, you know, Kat and, and the team at the Good Life Pledge around is making sure that we're actually resourcing and providing the physical place for all the magic that Eldred just talked about. That when you don't want to go and engage police, but you actually want to create a restorative justice model and actually address the harm and really heal from the harm that's been done around whether it's domestic violence incident or whatever it may be, you know, that there's actually a place for you to go. And that place is co-owned with the community and it's resourcing and serving at scale what the community actually needs. And so how do we offer housing, mental health services rather than criminalize them? How do we make sure that the capital stays within the community? Um, the first things first is we need to anchor in the community, and that's really what Aspire is, which is what you heard Eldra introduce earlier. 
Aspire is a place where that live, learn, grow, build model that is grounded in community-based public health and safety models all across the country that have been making communities safer, have been creating value and protecting our communities for decades, where they can actually be resourced um, and actually come to scale along with the needed real estate um, and housing services and supportive services, um, mental health services, entrepreneurship training and workforce training models, food and energy access um, into the communities that need it most. So these then become anchors in the community um, where we can hire local folks um, that will build out those properties, that build out around those communities to make sure that the community is able to own and lead its own development rather than just fuel gentrification and other forms of extraction. Um, but this, is, this isn't just philanthropy. You know, justice and healing delivers value to cities, counties, and states, and they know it, and gentrifying developers know it, <laughs> right? <laughs> when a community becomes safer, it becomes vulnerable for gentrification. When you increase transportation ask, ac access, when you increase food access, right? When I finally get a Trader Joe's where I can get some fresh food, then boop de doop boop you know, everybody gets pushed out, and I don't get to benefit from that. But in this model, in our approaches, um, communities are actually leading that, governing and owning those solutions um, and actually have a place so that they can make sure that they're fending off displacement, but actually creating more shared prosperity. Um, you know, just statistically, right, we can drill down into some of these numbers. An Urban Institute study found that in DC, for every 10 fewer incidents of gunfire, Per census track, one new business was opening and one less business was closing. 20 more jobs were going into those new businesses. 1.3 million more in sales were at those new businesses, right? Developers know <laughs> that having healthy and safe communities creates value. It's just usually extracted from those communities and leads to displacement. But there's another way, and it's replicable, um, and um, and that's what we're building. Hmm. When, when, when 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 you speak, speak about, about what we're building, building Christina, Christina. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm in this space. I want to use a pro a provocative word. So okay, we're talking Let's about abolitionism, mm -hmm. and and by definition. An abolitionist is a person who favors the abolition of a practice or institution. And this is something that Kat and our partners are modeling for mm -hmm. folks. We're talking about challenging the systems that are in place mm -hmm. and building new systems that work. Mm -hmm. that, that's what we're talking about here. Building systems that work for everyone, mm -hmm. not for some folks, that's not right. for most folks, yeah. not for the privileged privilege few, and we're not talking about knocking people down and making uh -huh. people wrong uh -huh. and, and, and placing blame. What we're talking about is, is building structures and putting things in place to empower folks uh -huh. to be able yep. to build their communities. That's when, right. when I think about, you know, post George Floyd, where we're at right now, I, I, you know, I heard the statistics about the commitments that were made just following those events and what the follow-up has been since then. Mm -hmm. And the question that I ask is, as, as a community, what, what does that say about us? What does that say about me? Mm -hmm. And a moment in time, what will my legacy be? Mm -hmm. What we're talking about here is legacy yeah. building. That's right. Yeah. Again, you know, we're talking about healing generational yeah. trauma and building a legacy for the future. That's right. Yeah, I mean, it's it's what do we build in its place, right? Mm -hmm. And who's going to govern that? Who's going to lead that? Who's going to own that? And there actually is a place, and I think, Kat, you know, you, you said this so eloquently earlier. You said we would need philanthropy if all these institutions were doing their job in the first place, right? And, and so literally what we're talking about with Aspire is building those institutions, um, in public-private partnership, 
but we are where we are um, given a little adrenaline <laughs> jump to those to those models. Um, and I think, you know, even when you are bringing that up, as we're building out these legacies, you know, one of the things that also makes me think um, Eldra is this kind of divest invest framework around abolition, right? If you're a person with wealth, 90, I would be willing to bet you a very large hot fudge sundae at my favorite ice cream spot that you have been invested in the building of, uh, of prisons in America because municipal bonds built every prison in America, <laughs> right? And every person who um, has a lot of wealth is deeply tied up in municipal bond industry, right? Um, both for its tax and advantages and, you know, it's a safe quote unquote place, right? Um, and in that, a lot of people don't know that they've been invested in police brutality settlements because literally cities, counties, and states bond those out as municipal bonds that we pay for as taxpayers and that people who buy those bonds make profits off of, right? So on the divestment side, there's so much to realign capital out of, right? But the question always becomes, what do you want to invest into? Mm -hmm. What do you want to invest into? And that's, you know, that's why we created Aspire. But I think that also on a state level, that's coming up as well. Um, earlier this year, for example, the state of Alabama wanted to build new prisons with um, Core Civic and one of our, you know, financial institutions, Barclays, um, who had committed to no longer financing private prisons, was going to finance the deal. Well, investors for the first time in the history of anybody knowing or knowing that this is possible, um, investors actually refused to finance that deal. The state of Alabama didn't have a problem putting forward that deal and going into debt around it, but investors actually refused to finance that deal. And they couldn't get it financed in the public markets. They couldn't get it financed in the private markets. Now they're doing some crazy, you know, Hail Mary to use COVID relief dollars to build these prisons. I mean, it's craziness, right? But this is how entrenched people are in those old ways, Eldra. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like they're going to live or die on that. And what they, and that's, you said this when we were prepping, you said all that comes from this intense place of fear. Don't they realize that you could be a part of the solution? Restorative justice, making communities healthy and safe. It's not just good for those communities. What is good for them will be good for everybody. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like, if 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 we can get police to stop killing black people, that will be great for white people, too. You know what I'm saying? And so in this process, um, making sure that we're bringing folks back into circle for them to understand that all of this is going to be good for everyone and that there's shared prosperity, both there's huge cost savings, huge cost savings that will go to the city, county and state. Every time we prevent a homicide in the state of New Jersey, we save the state $8.2 million. Mm -hmm. Our community-based public health and safety models are, are, are preventing dozens of those a year, even within a huge uptick in, in violent incidences, right? So there's huge amount of cost savings, but again, will the community participate? And so the paradigm that you're, that, you know, our audience here is hearing from you, from me, from Kat, from, from Chad and Taj is, coming back into relationship to each other so that there's shared prosperity. We don't have to be prosperous on the backs of someone else not being prosperous. That is a lie. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious, I wanna, I wanna see Kat, if you have some reflections on, you know, you, you've played a lot of roles in terms of you know, running a farm and a ranch and running a foundation and, and, and running a bank. Um, and, and I want to, I want to just sort of ask you to put on your banking hat for a second because, um, beneficial state bank, one of the most innovative, uh, financial institutions that we have really built to try to strengthen and grow community wealth. It was one of the places where you essentially transferred a bunch of your assets in a way that now are flowing out into communities in such powerful uh, ways. And, and banks play generally a really important role in local economic development. And as you sort of hear um, 
Eldra and, and Christina sort of talk about some of the, the, the barriers and challenges that, that they're working with, like from the perspective, from with your banking hat on, like what, what are the breakthrough solutions that you think might be here that other leaders in community banking need to understand in terms of specifically, like how do you support good local development that doesn't displace the people who it's supposed to benefit? And that's really been kind of the core challenge in, in local development is, is that problem. And, and yeah, just, just wanted to see if you had some reflections on that as, a, as, our, as our resident banker. <laughs> sure. So um, we are trying to be a good, innovative, community-forward, environmentally um, supporting bank in what is actually quite a bad system, but an essential system. We think of banking as the first and original, most powerful form of crowdfunding. We're just crowdfunding the wrong things. So to uh, Christina's framework of divest invest, we have to get the banks out of financing private prisons, fossil fuels, gentrification, extractive finance. We have to stop the harm. And then we have to turn at what is a very powerful, biggest industry on the planet is financial services toward uh, creating benefit for all. Um, and some of the strategies we've explored is really make our lending practice and our investment practice aligned with public benefit and community uh, econ economic development and environmental stewardship. Um, manage it to be a high percentage of doing that and um, no percentage doing the harm. But also um, using uh, charitable assets, uh, we are we get some from Treasury to, um, for instance, boost the amount of affordable housing we can finance. We're exploring the possibility of charitable capital coming in to stand in the place of equity that was stripped from communities, small business, households, uh, so that they can have a nest egg upon which we can lend money and they can grow that asset for their own wealth building. Um, so there's much to be done uh, and there's innovation on the horizon. Um, I know some people are fearful of blockchain developments um, and cryptocurrencies and smart contracts and everything, but we have to be prepared to harness new developments like that in favor of values banking and community benefit um, because it's probably coming down the pike and it does have the possibility of democratizing and opening up access to financial services. I think you can, because I think you just sort of illustrated the core uh, idea that we're exploring here, which is communities need access to all the different kinds of capital. But if we can, if we can help communities regain uh, stewardship of assets, then that's what allows them to access resources and multiply capital in all kinds of ways. And I think what you just shared is also a really powerful uh, illustration of kind of where the innovation that you've been doing in the financial sector meets the innovation that Eldra and Christina have been doing. And when we get that, when we get all of that creativity and innovation together, there's no problem that we can't solve. It's just, it's really, really exciting. The kind of, the kind of partnerships that, that, that happen in this space sort of between communities and between innovators, both on the capital side and the community side. So I want to, want to just sort of uh, go back to you, Eldra and Christina, because Kat and I are curious, just like, how has being a part of the, the the Good Life Pledge community sort of impacted and influenced the work that you're doing? And and what can we do next? Like, what can we do to sort of take it to the next level? Because we've done a, a tremendous amount together in the last year, but this is the time to take it take it take it to the moon. So, how, how has it been a benefit? And what and what do we need to be focused on next? Hmm. Uh, you use the word benefit and impact. The, the the greatest benefit and impact has been, from my perspective, connecting these communities, because we're we're talking about folks who we use this term boots on the ground. The folks who are the boots on the ground in these communities doing the work, and they're holding a lot of pain. They're holding a lot of trauma. They are are, are literally working and living and existing in in perpetual mass units in their community. And so what we've had the opportunity to do is connect with these folks and begin to create the spaces so the individuals who are providing the services and 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 healing and building the communities have a space to go and decompress, have a space to go and 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 relieve and heal and 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 get out the things that they're sitting on. 
And if I'm not able to do that, if I don't have a space to do that, it won't be long before I'm no good for anyone else. I need a space to do my, I have to do my own work. You know, we talk, if, if, if folks, again, I'm going to be a bit provocative. Think about 1994 and that 90 days between the Hutus and the Tutsis in Rwanda. And they had a thing called reconciliation because nobody was going anywhere. Kat mentioned, you know, it's about uh, doing no harm moving forward. Okay, yeah, we stopped doing harm and we still have to live together. We still have to be in community with one another. And if I'm still carrying uh, unhealthy energy towards you and some things that have happened, how healthy is the community going to be and vice versa? So what we can do moving forward, real simple, all sit in circle together. (laughs) <laughs> when I'm sitting in circle, I'm doing my work. I'm looking at those blind spots. I'm looking at those shadow parts of myself and I'm giving myself the opportunity to heal and I'm supporting others in healing. And I'm recognizing where we are, we have more things in common than not. So that's what we can do moving forward is invite everybody into these healing spaces. Because at the end of the day, we're all humans. We all bleed red. We all put on, you know, our, our, our shoes one foot at a time. Mic drop. Thank you, yeah. brother. And just that's just a little taste of what, what Elder's describing is um, the realest thing you've ever experienced. Just just really, really listening to each other and and each of us recognizing the work that we each have to do. And that and I think that's what, what I really like about the Good Life Pledge community is that everyone in this community is doing their work. Everyone in this community knows they have a role to play. Everyone in this community can make a contribution. And and we do that, you know, powerfully as, as just human beings coming together to solve these problems. So um, thank you. Just passing to Christina to, to um, yeah, to share, share your thoughts on, on what's next and, and how, how, it's, how it's supported the work. Yeah, I think a couple of different ways. Um, you know, one, I think almost every Good Life Pledge community has basically <laughs> asked us to come and partner with them. So it's given us, you know, Aspire location three, four, five, six, <laughs> you know, et cetera. Um, it's also, I think, as a community on the Good Life Pledge, allowed us to drop a lot de- deeper and get a lot more real than just kind of traditional philanthropy. You know, I remember when we first sat down with Doria, for example, you know, um, we were just in a small breakout room and she was hearing and, and me and Aaron had just come off of a circle that we had just facilitated. So we were kind of lit, you know what I mean? Just in general, energetically. And, you know, she was like, you know, this is something we never talk about, but yesterday I dodged three bullets. You know what I mean? Like this is just, ha- you know, all of it, all of this food and access and energy, like all the things we're talking about is still happening in the confines of a community that is not currently safe. And she was like, you know, the mental health that that means for our community. We just lost one of our members a couple of weeks ago. You know, it just allowed for a deeper drop in to the community, which really, I think, um, was important um, on that connection tip. And then the last thing I would say is just, um, you know, talking with folks like Chad, who I know y'all are going to hear from a little bit more in a second and others is just, we've been able to simplify our work a lot more. Like ultimately what is Aspire? Aspire is a real estate and venture private equity fund. (laughs) Like that's what it is, right? We're just doing it with the community not on the community or extracting from a community, but it's, um, so it's been of service to us to just keep it really, really simple. Cause those of us that are in the work, we can get so deep into it. You know what I mean? Um, and also I think that serves back for us to inform other investors to say, you know, no matter what asset class you're working in, we can help you get out of bad stuff and we can help you get into good stuff. Right. But then it's on us as a Good Life Pledge community to make sure that those products and services are, you know, at scale and able to absorb that level of capital support. And, um, you know, and that's on us. That's on us as a community to to operate together. But I think just simplifying it so that people don't get lost in all the words or maybe stuff that Mir Elder said was challenging to somebody, you know what I mean? Provocative. That's cool. Like, sit with that. You know what I'm saying? Sit with that. And also, it's really pretty simple. It's really pretty simple. We're just 
We're just making sure that we're resourcing communities who have already had a long track record of effective, efficient service delivery that has created value for somebody else. And we're just saying we could invest in them to participate in their own value creation. That's it. <laughs> Beautiful. 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 In its simplicity. <laughs> um, and so um, just want to appreciate both of you for giving us a little uh, a little taste of, of, of the healing that you've been doing and the foundation that you've been building. And, you know, in all of the projects that we work with and in all of the communities we work with, um, it's exciting that, that in the work that you do, what you've built is, is built to absorb capital to yesterday and all different kinds of capital at an extremely significant scale. And I think there's a way in which both the Spartanburg work and the, and the work in Push Buffalo kind of shows what can happen over time. And the work of Aspire and, and Inside Circle and Justice Capital is, a, is another example of, of anyone who's wondering, like, can communities do this at scale? Well, absolutely, the communities are ready um, to do it. We just, they just need the trust and the partnership um, to, to, make, to make that forward. And, and speaking of that, our, my, oh, my yeah. favorite... Um, Tosh, can I, can I say one thing? Oh, of course, I, and I, know, of course. I know time is a bandit. I, I see a question here and it's kind of sticking out to me. What's the value proposition these community-led initiatives deliver for their investors? And I'm not super sophisticated, but I was 19 years old and I had a six-week criminal trial that cost the county of Sacramento $1.3 million. And the folks that we are sitting with, the folks that we are supporting to not be going through a six week trial. I, I, I'm not a mathematician, but you add it up. <laughs> Thank you. That, I'm, that sitting, is I'm sitting with 35 young folks in, in, in New Jersey right now who are not committing crimes again, who are not killing again, who are not robbing again, who are not preying on their communities any longer. So I, I don't know what those figures look like, but it seems like a lot to me. Luckily, I do. Um, and yes, yeah, so we're talking about reduced policing costs, reduced incarceration costs, reduced medical and Medicaid costs, reduced prosecutor and court costs. Those are just direct benefits to government. Doesn't include also the direct benefits to um, the general public in terms of uh, reduced medical costs supported by high rates to, um, you know, to cover uncovered patients, um, as well as the indirect benefits um, to both government and general public reduced assistance program spending, increased educational participation and attainment, increased tax revenue on the property income and sales side. Also on the indirect benefits to general public, we're talking about growth in small businesses, access to capital increases, increased incomes and educational attainment, reduced pain and suffering, improved property values. We kind of go on. Um, and those are the value, that is literally the value that we're capturing within our structures, which I won't take up too much time here, but that's how um, that's our value proposition. And that's the value that gets extracted from our communities because we create that every day with our programs. Every single day, like we said, you know, for one homicide, we're saving the state of New Jersey eight point two million dollars. Times. Forty eight. But how much of that is going back into the south ward of Newark? So. Th thank you for that breakdown, Christina. I think I think the other thing for people to know, and it, and it relates to just this theme we coming back to of uh, asset transfer, and what's the role of asset transfer as a particular kind of gift, as a particular kind of contribution in relationship to unlocking some of these other resources. So within Justice Capital, you've got all of the kind of revenue-based financing savings that get redirected in communities, but it also creates opportunities for scaled investments to make conventional investments at conventional rates of return. So Christina can tell you a lot more about that, but that, that's the other thing that, that makes the model scale. There's room for the asset transfer, there's room for the public finance, there's room for the philanthropy, and there's room for, for um, conventional investment in, 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 in the development, which is, which is kind of the secret sauce of it. So um, I will leave you all to send a message to Christina and she will she will break that down for you. But now I want to turn to uh, one of my favorite people, Chad. 
who is who is a guardian of trust. He's a real big fan of not just trust-based philanthropy, but trust-based asset transfers, trust-based impact investment. Trust, trust, trust. Let's really trust the community. He's going to tell you a little bit about how how you can become a part of this and how this is growing. So let's pass it to Chad. Yeah, thanks everybody for including me today. Um, I mean, back to the value question, like how, you know, what can what can this community do? I think it's reorienting what we think of as valuable. Like I think there's like this fundamental shift in like, how, you know, what, what are we optimizing for? And it's, you know, historically capitalism optimizing for growth returns and, and it's reorienting what are we optimizing for? And, and uh, it's kind of the, one of the analogies for me for the good life pledge that's been useful is, and, and I guess step one to me is like a mindset shift. So, and it's shifting from grants to asset transfer and, 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 the analogy that has been useful to me for people with wealth privilege is thinking about like, what do you do to create stability for your kids? And for folks that have worked with um, indigenous groups and sort of being part of the village has been, you know, such a blessing to me. Um, they, when you're in those spaces, like everybody is family. Every email starts with, Hey, familia intros, Hey, relatives. So redefining what, what we think of as family uh, I think is it is it helps us re shift like what we think is valuable. And so if you think about traditional, like how you take care of your kids, if you have wealth privilege, you don't give them an allowance until they're 90. You, 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 you do something else, which is typically you would set up a trust and a trust is an asset transfer. Like you're doing, you're transferring an asset that's in their control. That is purpose is to create flourishing for that person that you really care about a lot. But we're not doing that with these communities yet, but we will. <laughs> and so to me, like traditional grants and 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 funding operations, super important, still have to do it. You still got to give your kids allowance. But to create long-term stability, we need to do asset transfer for the communities, just like we do for their kids. So that's like a mindset shift that has been helpful to me uh, in my thinking about how to have impact. And so I'm asking myself now, every dollar, both investment, philanthropy, impact investing, everything, how much of that is serving to build community wealth? So start to apply that filter to everything you do. Um, and second is to then, once you've bought in yourself, like wield your influence, like appreciate the influence you have and invite others to shift their mindset and to take the pledge and to opt in to this new way of doing things. Another mindset shift for me is that to realize that this is possible. Like it just feels, everything feels terrible. And like, it feels like we've been doing this stuff for so long and nothing's getting better. Everything's complicated, but this actually makes it pretty simple. Like it's, it's a pretty simple ask. If we can just shift assets, that's going to have a massive downstream leveraged effect going forward. So have some hope. Like it, we can do this, we can do this. And it's actually, when you break it down, it's pretty simple. And the action that makes it simple is number one, <laughs> match cast challenge <laughs> and, and, and participate with one of the initial good life pledge communities. And this is a way of converting part of this element. I'm going to go into the detail, but you're actually converting this DAF resource. If you have donor advised fund, that money is inert for the most part, except for when you're doing grants, but we all know sort of the deployment percentage of DAFs is not great. So you've got this inert capital sitting in your DAF, turn it into a productive asset, you can do that by matching CATS challenge because you're taking part of your DAF as a loan guarantee and turning that into capital in these communities and giving them access to capital they wouldn't otherwise have. So that's one, that's one easy button. Sign up to Good Life Pledge and support the community match CATS challenge. Beyond that, uh, funding community capital vehicles. When you think about this is a way to get your percentage up, how much of your capital is going to build community wealth, you can increase that percentage by doing more and doing it in the direction of supporting community capital vehicles. And um, uh, Taj and Rachel and folks have started this, this resource called Community Capital Info that has a list of these type of entities that you can give to. So it's a way of shifting your mindset. If you shift to your mindset that you wanna increase, improve your percentage going to community wealth, this is another way to do it. And then finally, just simplest is if you have land, give it back to the people it was stolen from. <laughs> that's that's the most easy, that's like the easiest asset transfer sort of mental model for folks. I think there's a subset that folks that actually have you know land to do, but that's again, an easy button. Um, and finally, um, the idea of expanding, expanding the, the message and the, and the understanding of Good Life Pledge is, is idea of creating cohorts in the communities that you're in. So 
I'm in the Philanthropy Workshop, which is a, is a network of 400 social investors who are actually committed to um, disrupting the status quo in philanthropy. Trust-based philanthropy was like sort of the starting point. I sort of see Good Life Pledge as like trust-based, you know, squared. <laughs> and, um, and they use like proven best practices and really dynamic peer learning to do that. So Philanthropy Workshop is a community that I'm a member of. And so in partnership with them, we're excited to say that we're going to start a Good Life Pledge cohort within Philanthropy Workshop. So if you're in a community, any community like that, and you're interested in this, expand it by, by starting a cohort and we can, we can help you do that. And so it's going to start with, a, with a, an action lab is what they call it. And they're also very aligned on the principle of it's important to learn, it's important to have community, but it's also important to do stuff. And so like, what is the action that's going to come out of this, not just talking and feeling good about each other? Um, so ultimately, we're hoping to do is create a cohort that's going to opt into the Good Life Pledge and to, to match the commitment to support one of the five communities. And so if we can do that, um, you know, that if you apply that idea, think about all the communities you're in, think about who might be attracted to this, to this model. This is how we can expand it. And to, you know, to Eldra's point, start to be in community with other people who are interested in this new, new direction and which is something we can do. It is, it is possible. So that's how I think the SOCAP folks can help. So invite you to yeah. join us. Happy to, uh, you know, collaborate and brainstorm on how to do it. Thanks, Chad. So, so if you're out there thinking that, like, hey, we need a SOCAP uh, cohort in the Good Life Pledge, um, reach out, reach out to Chad, reach out to Kat, reach out to us, and we'll we'll help you organize that. We're having some good conversations with our with our friends in Tonic and Resource Generation, Donors of Color Network, and some of the other uh, networks that have made real commitments to equity in in what in in the resources that they're stewarding, and and talking with them about doing a very similar process to what um, Chad described with. Uh, with uh, TPW, so that's 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 one of the ways we're growing the community. So I want to pass it um, to Kat for just any last reflections and um, learning appreciations uh, for the conversation we've had and what's coming next. Um, well, I think it's my job to say that we have to hold ourselves accountable. Um, philanthropy has made some pledges that it hasn't kept in the past, and this is definitely an age where if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Um, and also that winning slow is losing. So we have to do it right away. Um, and we can build community around holding ourselves accountable. Um, and um, the joy of recognizing that when frontline communities do well, we will all feel better and be healthier and be well and uh, achieve um, uh, the mutualism that we need to heal our planet stay on here, not get spit out not like a watermelon seed, um, and realize a lot more joy and self-determination. Beautiful. Thank you, Kat. And I, and I completely, as usual, lost track of time. I'm, we're probably beyond our big pointed hour, but appreciate everyone who's, who's, uh, who's hung in there. Um, uh, if you are on your way to other sessions, please, please stay uh, engaged in, in the SOCAP. Uh, dialogues there's just so much that comes out of these conversations uh every year but along along the way so cap is just such an important place for us to come together and looking forward to when we'll all be able to to be in a, in a big giant warehouse again um because that, that's always fun when we can do this non-virtually and and uh, hoping everyone's doing all the health and safety things that we need to do in order to get closer to that reality so just deep appreciation for you all joining us in the conversation and um, now is officially the after party, which is where we linger and hang out and uh, drink champagne. Uh, no, no champagne. I got just tea. But uh, <laughs> and, we, and we sort of just talk with whoever wants to jump in and, and talk. So, so some people on the panel may have to go because they're very busy. But I'll hang out for a little while and whoever wants to chat, we, we'll, we'll hang out until so no one Thanks, Kat. Thanks, Kat. Thanks, Chad. Thanks, Aldra. Appreciate y'all. Thank you. Well...